Funding for this program has been provided in part by the U.S. Forest Service through a Wood Innovations Grant and the Nevada Rangeland Resources Commission. Eastern Nevada Landscape Coalition was started in 2001, so it has a number of years that it's been uh, working basically on restoring the uh, ecosystems of the Great Basin to bring back biodiversity that has unfortunately been lost or has diminished and also dealing with the impact of invasive plant species on the local ecosystems. In general, what is happening is because of climate change and because of the changes in the amount of rainfall and drought and whatnot, we're getting more and more fires that reach such an intensity that they basically sterilize an area totally. There's nothing left. Climate change is the major factor driving the expansion of pinyon and juniper trees and their effect on other ecosystems. Year 2000 is kind of the tipping point. After that, we have been regularly setting global temperature records. And we're now at temperature levels globally probably higher than we've had in 500 years. And as a result, since 2000, fire size, frequency, intensity has significantly increased. The area burned in high intensity has more than tripled. And everything in here now is all trees that have established during a pulse surge of expansion that occurred during the 20th century. And this has been recorded all across the Great Basin. Through the Little Ice Age, relatively constant rate of tree establishment in the 20th century just takes off. And most of the trees we have here are examples of that. Cheat grass now dominates the site. I think more important than that dynamic is the climate, the warmer it gets, the more competitive cheatgrass becomes. The productivity of cheatgrass has increased by almost a third. Then you add in the temperature increase. That's one third more fuels, one third more competitive ability against the native perennial. Prior to treatment on public lands, areas are studied and analyzed through a detailed scientific process. So the process is that as we come up to a watershed, we begin the assessment phase with an ID team. And the first part of that is that we'll take all the monitoring data we have across all the programs and it's available to us to identify what we can learn about the landscape. From there, we complete the assessment of the watershed, include the public through the process to kind of determine where the health and function of that watershed is at. And this is for all land uses as well as vegetative communities and everything else within the watershed. Uh, so for instance, the watershed we're in here is the South Stepto watershed. It's a little over 200,000 acres through the assessment and implementation plan. We use a metric called the fire regime condition class, which is broken into three condition classes. Our objective is to get closer to the FRCC1, which is characterized as a 33% departure from that reference condition. And the theory is once you approach that FRCC1, natural processes can start to take over and manage the landscape and maintain its function. In treatment design, our overall objective is to try and mimic what a natural disturbance would have done across the landscape. We're planning our treatments to leave you know, stringers and islands and fingers, not just for wildlife habitat, but to represent kind of what would have occurred on the landscape if a natural event were to have come through. But the objective of the watershed is to manage the landscape for a balanced landscape. If we manage the landscape providing for all the different cereal classes of vegetation that are identified in the reference condition. It'll provide all the niches for the wildlife that's needed on its own. Basically, along the Highway 50 corridor, we are creating a fuel break. So this helps out rural towns when they actually get fire. So the meaning behind this is to create the fuel break from anything getting over into the Wooey area, which is wildland urban interface. We are creating that fuel break so we can have a jump on the fire, whether it's back burns with our engines or aircraft. After this type of treatment, there is an opportunity to manage for a better return of the native plants. So with the understory, we come through with the seeding process try to bring in the native grass. It also helps out with the wildlife. The one thing that we are trying to mitigate as well, along with bringing in the native grass, is cheat grass. That's been our biggest proponent uh, for carrying fire. It's very continuous. So in this area, the ground fuels are very sparse. As far as like wildlife coming through, they go quite a ways to find any type of food. So 
where we actually try to seed and bring in the native grasses again. It kind of helps out along with the wildlife and making the area look a little bit more appealing. These treatments, they're getting a lot of use from the wildlife. Obviously, we have other limiting factors like water, such as in this drought, but just the qualitative assessment, we're seeing a lot of use from ungulates as well as sagebrush obligate, sage grouse, and a lot of nesting birds are using these treatments, and a lot of them are actually using the slash to nest in. This site kind of represents our transition from the uh, sagebrush communities up into mountain brush, mountain mahogany type sites. Right here, we're just looking at Mount Mahogany. As this unit rolls over this ridge, we get a lot more mountain brush, you know, uh, service berry, mountain mahogany, things like that. So our objectives here were to remove the pinion juniper canopy layer that was overtopping the mountain mahogany as well as the understory species and to have that release. This treatment was completed just a couple months ago before we entered wildlife restrictions. So the understory hasn't really had a chance to respond yet and the current drought isn't helping that, but uh, I do think that it will respond well and we'll have a good response from the understory vegetation here. Um, we're already seeing a lot of wildlife coming in and using you know, the sprouts and things that are coming up and, uh, and relying on that. The various phases of PJ encroachment help determine management and fire risk. I like to use the tree dominance index Tree cover divided by total vegetation cover. Phase three, tree cover is more than two thirds of the total. Phase two, tree cover is one third to two thirds of the total vegetation cover. Phase one, tree cover is less than a third of total vegetation cover. You can have a whole bunch of little trees invade out into the sagebrush and then stop. For a few years, you'll be phase one. As those trees grow, you transition into phase two as they keep growing, you may even transition into phase three. Phase one, you're primarily burning the understory. And if you've got a good herbaceous component there, particularly bunch grasses, the large ones, you can get a good response. You can get a good recovery from that fire. By the time you get to phase three and full tree dominance, there's very little understory left to respond after the fire. And that's just open season for sheet grass. Old growth pinion and juniper present a different fire dynamic and possibly a different treatment for the tree's survival. This is an old growth, most of it. There has been some infilling, but there's a lot of old trees in here. These are all pre-settlement trees, I mean, except for the infilling. There's trees in here I think are easily over 300 years old. The infill is adding a lot of fuels that could carry a fire that otherwise would not be here. The trees would otherwise be fairly spaced, but these all these infilling trees through here are adding fuels that could carry a crown fire. Dr. Tausch suggests a novel treatment approach be considered to prevent fire from destroying these old growth PJ forests. Pick some areas with fairly decent old trees in them. Take out the surged expansion trees that came in primarily during the 20th century. Except maybe for one here and there, if there's one of these older trees that's dying, then replace it. It may be the best native dominated ecosystem we have left that could potentially hold off both fire and sheet grass for some period of time. Large trees far enough apart to avoid crown fire, still close enough to get dominant enough to keep the herbaceous fuels out of the understory. You can see that's largely happening in here. There's hardly even sheet grass under these. In the 10 years since we've started the partnership, one of the exciting things is just how much more information we have about the PJ Woodlands, not only their history and why they're in the condition they're in now, um, but things that can really help with management going forward. It's really important if we've already made this investment to continue forward with it. And I think that if it's also documented and published, that will be even better as well. In the face of unprecedented climate change and in the absence of some level of management, the end result following catastrophic wildfire is cheatgrass dominated monoculture. However, using the best available science and monitoring to inform management, we can design treatments that mimic historic natural processes, such as smaller, less intensive fire and create more resilient ecosystems that maintain both pinion and juniper, but in a better balance with the other key perennial grasses and shrubs.